Hey folks, and welcome to the Counter Clipping Show. This is episode number 73. We are the show for May 9th, 2022. So I'd like to welcome everybody aboard. We have a whole bunch of stuff to talk about tonight, including some news stuff, some wargaming news stuff, some... Oh, I'm making a note to, to talk about that. I just thought it's something else. Um, the... Um, The Kickstarter rewards for uh, Herman Lutman's A Most Fearful Sacrifice have begun to arrive in the hands of uh, Kickstarter backers. So if you backed that, you should be getting your uh, very nice, very fancy game very soon. We're already starting to see unboxing videos of that. So, uh, so that is on the way. Our topic tonight is the Avalon Hill Classics, and we're actually going to go through a list of Avalon Hill Classics. Um, and we can, of course, talk about that in the chat as well. But in the meantime, we are drinking Oban Little Bay, which we're... I'm, I'm kind of trying to fight my way through it. I feel like I, I, I wanted Oban for its peatiness. And where my palate is, at least today, this, this tastes incredibly fruit-forward rather than uh, peat-forward. So that is, you know, not, nothing wrong with that. It's just that it wasn't what I was 
uh, looking for in a scotch today. So hopefully we had some behind the scenes uh, technical problems right before the stream. So hopefully everything will work out okay. Um, let us hope that that is the case. In the meantime, let us say hello to Andrew Cook, Bill Simone, Bleak Outlook 08, Brian Gash, Captain Asparagus, Chad Kennedy, Chet Bell, Christopher Press, Daniel Barney, David Imperato, Farshad Niazi, Fast Hines, Henry Sikursky, H. Tuna, Jack P., James Whitmer, Jason W., Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Wesovich, John Longshore is in the house, Kevin Paulson, Kilroy, if Kilroy was here, Manders, Mark McNair, Marty Sample from sunny New England is here, Matt Davidson, Michael Mellon, Mike Anthony, Mo Romaniak, Patrick of Patrick's Tactics and Tutorials, Rob Johnson, Ronald Dickinson, Stephen Roberts, Stigler is in the house, Tim Zales, Todd Walser, Tony Mammel, Vince Ree, and William Ahrens. So I actually used the list feature uh, from YouTube that time, and it actually seemed to work correctly, uh, which is different from how it usually works. So, um, and so I'm sure I missed some people. If I missed you, I apologize. We will we will perk you up here in a little bit. So for those who don't know, please do thumbs up the video, do subscribe to the channel, um, and if you'd like to help support the channel, uh, thank you patrons. Uh, there's a link to the Patreon in the video description, so check that out. And super chats are on for those who you know have a really important question that they would like to ask. Uh, the, the super chat guarantees that I will not miss it one way or the other, even if it takes me a minute to find it. So. Although we, we put that to the test last week, and I almost screwed it up, but not quite. So this week, we, we do not have giveaways this week. However, I have decided that somehow there is going to be an RPG stream as well. It's going to be an, a, a monthly event, and I will have that on the schedule by next week's show. So And to kick that off, I have some RPG giveaways which will be happening in that stream, which will be the Traveler Little White Classic um, SF Rules. I will have this uh, shipped from DriveThruRPG. I am a moron, so I have ordered an extra copy of Call of Cthulhu Gateways to, Terrors, uh, Gateways to Terror. This is three scenarios for Call of Cthulhu, so we'll give that away. And I've got another shrink-wrapped copy of the RuneQuest starter set because... Uh, that's, it's me, right? So, so we'll be giving those away when we do that RPG stream. This way I'll have like an outlet for that stuff without necessarily taking up time in the Wargaming stream for it. I'm sure it will get mentioned anyway, but that should help to minimize the amount of drag. All, oh, Patrick of Patrick's Tactics and Tutorials, thank you. Uh, Frank, thanks for letting me know. All of the previous giveaways are now out as of today. Uh, International UPS turns out to be extra pain in the ass but it was uh less expensive than i expected it to be i expected it to be 60 dollars, and it was 30 and change so, or 30 something and change so that that's way more reasonable than i expected it to be i mean it is canada right it's not like where i'm shipping it to guam but uh what a big headache that was so Local UPS drop-off points do not uh, are not able to handle UPS International is the lesson there. So, um, what is going on? So, we finished three more engagement scenarios for Pacific War. Uh, I believe that we will be finishing up our run of engagement scenarios one way or the other this week. Um, it's, you know... You kind of got to read the rules very carefully. It is a Mark Herman game. That is fairly typical for Mark Herman games. So none of us are surprised by that. And we believe we are getting the hang of it. So uh, let us hope that we are right. By, because next week I hope to be playing one of the battle scenarios. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, the other game night is our OCS night. Um, I did not make it last week due to problems. Which you may have foretold from the events of last week. Um, but, uh, they did get a half a turn finished of Blitzkrieg Legend, and of course we continue to play Third Winter, so, uh, so that is going pretty well, I think. And, and, you know, we've got the, the Germans, uh, retreating aggressively, let's put it that way. So, let's hit some water here. All right. So I did, I was in Cleveland for Mother's Day yesterday. Uh, and there was a bit of a, a minor adventure, I decided, you know, I'm going to stop at the war zone. 
and the war zone was not open. It was their posted hours was like 11 to 7, I believe. And I was there at about 1, and they're like, they're not open. Are they this like completely shuttered? Are they out of business? What's up? So I called them. They didn't answer. Um, I posted on Twitter. It was like, hey, anybody know anything? Nobody knew anything. Um, a couple hours later, they called me back, said, yeah, we will open late. It's Mother's Day. We tried to post it on Google, and Google didn't take it. So sorry. Uh, so I stopped on the way out instead of the way in. Um, and picked up a couple of things. Uh, there's a, an enormous quantity of wargaming stuff there, including some goodies. Not everything is at a bargain price, um, and it is a nightmarish fire hazard, uh, as it remains, for anybody who's been in there. So, uh, you know, it is, it is worth a stop if you are in Cleveland. It is just north of Cleveland Airport on Rocky River Drive. Uh, Warzone Matrix is the full name of the store. So... So, that is what was happening there. Uh, we have some news, which I will hop over to the other screen to talk about. So, let's make that happen. And before we do any of that, let's hit the social media post, because I forgot. I was scrambling to make sure the stream was working. I had to, I had to put the stream key back in uh, right before the stream. And that is a thing that I prefer, but strongly prefer not to have to do right before the stream. Cause it's supposed to basically never change. Uh, so let's hop over to this and there we go. Okay. GMT has announced P 500 charging and shipping update. Uh, what they're saying is, uh, by last Friday, all copies of El Moravid should have shipped. I'm not sure if that's true, but my copy is in the post. Um, and Tuesday, May 10th, their process, which is tomorrow, they're processing P500 charges for the CDG Solar System, Churchill Third Printing, and Red Storm Baltic Approaches. The only thing I personally am on the hook for is Red Storm Baltic Approaches. Uh, and they plan to start shipping those on Monday, May 16th. Um, so that is the news out of GMT. Uh, for those who are into the Kickstarter thing, Enemy Action Kharkov is up for Kickstarter with eight days. One of these shotgun Kickstarters the Compass has been doing. Um, eight days left on this. They're only 10-day Kickstarters for Enemy Action Kharkov. I know a lot of people are super excited about Enemy Action Kharkov. It's, it, it took a while to get it out. Um, it is real nice. You will see... A, um, you will see a preview video from Mo probably in a couple of days and from me a couple of days after that. And there'll be at least a couple of days of Kickstarter left by the end of that. So if you haven't pre-ordered this already, your last minute Kickstarter mechanism uh, is, uh, is your la last minute pre-order mechanism from Compass is Kickstarter. So this is up right now. Hey, they're probably going to sell an extra several hundred copies, which at their print runs is uh, pretty low. Um, DAC, they wanted 350 for Warzone at, uh, for DAC. DAC, it's DAC 1. I, I did check that. Um, that is a price that is not out of line for DAC. Uh, their price for Enemy at the Gates was 100 which is not awful, but I felt like it was a little high. I feel like that's, that really should be about 80 Um, but, uh, they, they have, somebody came in there and dumped a lot of unpunched gamer stuff. So they've got a lot of gamer stuff. They've got a lot of TCS, a lot of OCS, um, and actually a lot of SCS as well. Um, and all kind of, you know, crazy stuff from places like Critical Hit and stuff. And I'll mention this, if anybody got in to last year's Call of Cthulhu Classic Kickstarter, this is about to start shipping as well. Uh, final charges will hit next week, uh, the end of this week, I think. Yeah, the end of this week, and shipping should start next week. Uh, you you had to go through backer kit to get your rewards, which was which I think I understand why people do it from a Kickstarter management point of view. It makes tons and tons of sense from a customer point of view. Backer kit could make it easier to deal with. So. Jeff, I could be misremembering. Maybe it was 250. I thought it was 350. I could be wrong. Maybe it was 250. 250 is a pretty good price for DAC one. And remember that you can play DAC one with DAC two uh, rules. So it, the the differences between the counters and maps are not big. Uh, so that is all I have that I have to. No, it isn't actually. Let's go over here and talk about Avalon Hill stuff. So of course Avalon Hill starts um, in 1954. 
with Tactics, the Charles Roberts. And of course, when, when Tactics is released, it's still the Avalon Game Company and not even Avalon Hill yet. Um, Avalon Hill hits, apparently, later in 1954 with this game, Bali, which looks like it came from... I don't know what the story is on this. I'm not going to really focus on the non-war games from Avalon Hill, though, so we're going we're gonna to blow through a lot of these things. Um, let me zoom... There we go. That's a little little bigger. Uh, I, I, I feel like uh, there is reason to say that Avalon Hill's history of producing historical board games begins in 1958 with the publication of Gettysburg. What we have is Gettysburg 58. Uh, my copy of El Moravid should also be showing up on uh, tomorrow, hopefully. Um and this is, you know, this Gettysburg is the game. Uh, it was admittedly not play tested at all, and I think you could tell. Um, it was rev every time they re-released it, it was basically re significantly revised. So uh, it's probably a game that, that this version of doesn't hold up well. But some of the later versions, one of the versions from the seventies, I want to say seventies, um, and we might see that in here in this list, um, is. Uh, I think do hold up reasonably well. So we got some non-war game stuff, things like Dispatcher and Verdict. U-Boat, uh, though, is, you know, I, I think a bit of a classic and and maybe one of the earliest Avalon Hill titles that I, I'd say is maybe worth playing. Um, feel free to correct me on that. Who knows? Uh, football Strategy, 1959. Diplomacy, 1959. But, of course, Diplomacy did not originate with Avalon Hill. Uh, diplomacy originated with somebody else, and who was that? Ugh, 20, 20 plus publishers. I'm not surprised by that. I'm, I'm looking for the original publisher. Was that originally a Jedco a publication? That's possible, I guess. Uh, but yeah, that uh, the, uh, diplomacy did not originate with Avalon Hill, but it was one of those acquisitions uh, by Avalon Hill. Uh, management Dutch days. I don't know what this even is, and apparently BGG doesn't either because there's no picture of it. Oh, William Byrd has having FedEx problems with a most fearful sacrifice. That is unfortunate. Uh, Mashing P. This is sorted by date, not by uh, not by. And I started at the back of the list. So we're actually moving forward, not back. It's 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 where it is in the list because it's pretty early. So moving up a, a page here. Uh, Verdict 2, New Chess, which was one of a number of chess variants that Avalon Hill tried to foist upon us at various times. Uh, D-Day 61, that's actually kind of a game about not just D-Day, but the whole Western Front campaign, really. Um, as I recall, it's been a while since I've actually seen it on a table, but not that long, actually. Uh, Civil War 1961, that's probably not worth anybody's time at this point. Uh, Chancellorsville 1961, this, uh, this, this stayed around longer than I thought, and apparently there's two different versions of it, one of which might be significantly better than the other one, so I may have heard that... Um, Diplomacy's BGG rank is 699. That's quite high, uh, but I'm also not surprised particularly. B Diplomacy's a well-regarded game, whether I personally enjoy playing it or not. Um, Air Empire, Waterloo. I, I would actually like some enterprising board game channel, not war game channel, <coughs> to actually go back and try to play a bunch of these Avalon Hill non-war games to see which of them hold up. I strongly suspect that the only one that really holds up is probably going to be a choir. Um, and, of course, Diplomacy. Uh, and then, of course, we have Waterloo, which is which is another seminal game. I think maybe doesn't hold up as well as you'd think, but it, but it is a seminal game, right? A lot of people were introduced to the hobby by either Gettysburg or Waterloo, one of the versions of Gettysburg anyway. A variety of other things. We have Bismarck, which actually I think is is quite an influential title. Uh, Chad Kennedy says, "Which Avalon Hill war game is worth pursuing?" That's for someone that doesn't have any. I think there are several that hold up exceptionally well today, and we, and we'll get to those. Um, Stalingrad is not one. I think Stalingrad is actually kind of a kind of a rotten game. Um, 
and for that matter, I think Africa Corps is, is a fairly another seminal title, right? But but I also think that Avalon uh, that Africa Corps does not hold up well today, um, and we'll see that in this list as well. Uh, Midway, nineteen sixty four. Midway. I've never played this. I've had I've heard mixed things about it. Uh, some people really enjoyed it, and it is once again a seminal game. Um, let, more so than something like U-Boat, just because it was released like in you know ten years later, well eight years later, something like that. Here's the seminal Africa Corps. Um, important game, very influential game, was surpassed just a couple of years later by uh, by better treatments of the topic. Uh, and of course, Acquire, which I actually have a copy. I, I found a flea market copy for a couple of dollars, uh, which somewhat remarkably is actually complete. Um, um, Drew Detterer says that Midway is a uh, fun game, terrible history. Oh, uh, you know, I can, I can live with that, I think. Uh, Kriegspiel, oof. Well, so, I mean, there's Kriegspiel and then there's Kriegspiel. Um, I would not consider, for what it's worth, and we'll see it when it comes up in the list, I would not consider Republic of Rome to be a war game. However, it is a fantastic game. Um, we'll see that when it comes up. Uh, Squander, Blitzkrieg, was another one of these uh, sort of fictional land RPGs that Avalon Hill did with Tactics and Tactics 2, and which have been attempted from time to time by other publishers as well. I have never been able to even feign interest in such a thing. Um, and I'm not sure what that says about me as a gamer, right? Does it mean that my, my love of Hex Encounter stuff is not so great that I am willing to deal with made-up nonsense in the sense of Hex and you know, just because it's Hex Encounter? I mean... I'll be happy to play like a, a decent fantasy game, but but then I'm you know I'm signing up for a fantasy game or a sci-fi game or something like that, and not some kind of like generic World War II esque thing that has like no historical reference point. Um, to, to me, that kind of thing simply does not make sense. Um, uh, Battle of the Bulge, Bulge sixty five. I think this is probably. When I, when I talk about Avalon Hill games that I think are, are maybe worth a look nowadays, I believe Bulge 65 is probably the earliest one. Uh, it, I think, rema it's a, was very influential. I think remains a quite good game, um, and I think is worth the time. Um, what else do we got? Guadalcanal. Um, I don't know that that has a particularly good reputation, but, you know, if you're super into Guadalcanal... Maybe that's something that you feel really feel like you have to look at. It's kind of gimpy looking, I think, with you know the very old school pink counters and stuff like that. So I don't really have an, a strong opinion about it one way or the other. Jutland, of course, is another one of those seminal classics, and that's a, a game that a lot of people had a lot of fun with. Um, kind of a miniatures game, kind of a board game. Is it both? Is it neither? Good question. Oh, that's another thing. Apparently... Somebody, oh, in, in other gaming news, Noble Knight is having their spring sale. So if you want to get a discount on basically everything from Noble Knight, go check out their site right now. They sent out an email about it. Um, I managed to find some, um, some stuff for myself that I felt was reasonably priced uh, and that I wanted to buy. And it is here now, actually. And it, most of it is on the, show, on the shelf uh, behind me. So, but that was not war game stuff. That was RPG stuff. Okay, that's good for now. Um, so, um, in that space, I forgot what I was gonna what what I was gonna say. Um, Alphonse Rousseau, Avalon Hill is nominally still around as an appendage of Hasbro, um, and uh, I mean, I I think you cannot say that Avalon Hill still exists in a meaningful way. Let me put it that way. So, uh, yeah, Dan did a video for Noble Knight's, uh, Noble Knight's Big Sale. So check that out if you're interested. I don't have a link or anything, but it's, you know, it's noblenight.com. You guys all know where it is. So. Uh, Feudal, which is another chess-like thing. 
Uh, Year of the Lord and Journeys of St. Paul, Avalon Hill's brief detour into religious games, which were produced very cynically, <laughs> uh, for those who know the story behind that. 1914. This is a uh, Jim Dunnigan design, actually. And it's interesting. It, it's not fun to play. Let me put it that way. Everybody agrees that it is not fun to play. Um, but um, it is a Dunnigan design and reproduces the campaign very faithfully, which means, of course, uh, that it is mostly a, a, a really, really tiresome slog. So you probably are not well served by looking up 1914. There are some variant rules for that that are supposed to make it a little more playable, but, um, you know, again, it's it's a it's a... It's the kind of World War One game that ruined World War One as a topic for a lot of people for a long time. Um, CNO, BNO, some of these things. I'm always interested to see the ones which are invariably the non-war games because their war games tended to stick around for a while, uh, at least for a while. Um, the no, some of the non-war games did not, so it's always interesting for me to see Avalon Hill games that I don't remember ever seeing in a catalog or on a shelf. Um, and CNO BNO is one of those. Uh, and of course, we have the seminal Panzer Blitz. Uh, this is one of the all-time great war games, um, and I, it's one of those that I think d doesn't hold up particularly well today. But it's easy to get, it's easy to play, and for the experience of playing it, it is probably worth a look. Do not, whatever you do, do not go and pay fifty or eighty dollars or some bananas price for a copy of friggin' Panzer Blitz. Um, it is they they printed half a million copies of the thing. It's a twenty dollar game at most. Um, now, if you find like a shrink wrap copy or something like that, which by the way is really rare because people played. Um, uh, people played Panzer Blitz, so it's very rare to see uh, even unpunched copies, let alone uh, shrink wrapped copies. Mac Daddy, first of all, welcome to the stream. Stream Stalingrad is just a failure. Um, is a is just a mechanical failure. It's it's one of these sort of broken East Front experiences that Anzio is a pain to set up. I can I can vouch for that. Um, it's just one of these broken East Front experiences that flatly doesn't work. Um, and it's not just Stalingrad either, right? It's like most of the East Front. So you're, if you're looking for a Stalingrad-themed game, you're better off looking for something more tightly themed to Stalingrad. Um, Luftwaffe. I think this is another game that a lot of people cut their wargaming teeth on. Yeah, but Stalingrad was kind of case blue, but, but, but sucky. Um, that's not an inaccurate statement. I wonder what these yellow guys are. Well, we'll figure it out. It's all good. Um, Luftwaffe is... I've never played Luftwaffe. I'm not 100% sure that I've ever owned Luftwaffe either. Um, but it was around for a long time. Um, <clears throat> very early... I mean, from, from my perspective, early game, right? Because it's... Um, it's... 1970, right? This is like the, when I was born, literally. So, well, not literally. I was born in 71, for the record. Um, so, and it's a classic game. It's, uh, it's. Uh, I can't vouch for how good it is now, but a lot of people had a lot of fun with it, and I think it probably still is reasonably fun today. Um, Kriegspiel. Uh, this is a notorious turd. Um, it has nothing to do with the, the von Reiswitz Kriegspiel and really only just says Kriegspiel and it's a super abstract, uh, almost rules-free strategy game. Um, it is a historical oddity and artifact and that's about it. Uh, no, nobody recommends this. If you hear people talking about the, their awesome experience with Kriegspiel, uh, they're talking about uh, like a von Reischwitz or open Kriegspiel type of experience, which is not Avalon Hills Kriegspiel at all. Uh, that is a thing that I've seen people get hung up on. Trireme. Trireme originally was a battle line game. A lot of, we, we are starting to get into the part of Avalon Hill where they started to acquire... Uh, Brant, thanks for stopping by. And yes, please thumbs up the video. Blah, blah, blah. Support. Blah, 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 blah. Subscribe to the channel. All that jazz. Um, uh, Trireme, I've got this. I picked it up not that long ago. It's it's a it's a pretty rare topic. Ancient naval warfare is a, is a quite rare topic. There's only about three games ever on it. Um, 
Trireme, the Elise Avon Hill Trireme was was uh, was saddled with those those really crappy uh, quality boards that Avalon Hill was using for a while that just warp crazily. Um, so there, that's unfortunate. Um, but nevertheless, at some point I would like to play it. But I, I do retain a copy of Trireme. I played relatively few of the Avalon Hill sports games, but I did play Status Pro Baseball and Status Pro Football, and actually liked both of them, to be honest. Uh, it's not something I would choose to engage in right now, but I did like both of them at the time. Um, Sleuth, never even seen that. Origins of World War II. This is another Jim Dunnigan design, and actually, looking at it, somebody, it may have been Stuka Joe, did some video on this, and I believe this game was... 30 years ahead of its time actually and and probably was not maybe not well developed uh because it was so far ahead of its time uh but there's a there's a lot to like in in origins of world war ii and again it's 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 it, it i don't think it can be called an unqualified success or a classic necessarily but it's a fascinating design and i think if it were designed now it would have gotten a very different reception and would have been developed quite differently um, you can absolutely play Trireme with minis, and that's really not a bad idea. Um, Image, I, I do remember Image more or less for its uh, very nice cover, fe prominently featuring Henry VIII. Um, Executive Decision, Alexander the Great. This is actually a Gary Gygax design. Um, this was originally, I want to say this was originally published by Gaidon Games, yeah. So... This was a Don Greenwood collaboration with Gary Gygax. To what extent that's true, I'm not sure. I kind of think Gary did most of the work on this. Uh, but this is Gogamella, if I'm not mistaken, right? It is Gogamella. Um, and it's another kind of artifact, I think. Probably not very heavy by modern standards um, and possibly not worth your time, but, it, but it's an interesting artifact uh, just because of that. Status Pro Basketball, which I never played and which i'm not sure i ever actually saw on the shelf to be honest um rick tofen's war ricky's war is another all-time avalon hill it was probably one of the most played avalon hill games very common again just like luftwaffe don't pay a ton of money for a copy of of ricky's war or or uh or luftwaffe because they, they they printed them in enormous numbers and they were in print for decades um, but lots of people had lots of fun and cut their teeth on these games. You know, maybe they don't hold up that well today, but a lot of people had a lot of fun with them back at the time. And generally speaking, they're not hugely complicated. Um, outdoor Survival. So there's an interesting... Outdoor Survival was one of the Avalon Hill's best-selling games for a long time. Um, and here's why. Uh the first edition, the the original white box or brown box, if you like, D and D, actually said for wilderness rules, go buy a copy of Avalon Hills Outdoor Survival rather than having wilderness rules in the game. Um, that's a, a little weird, but B resulted in in Outdoor Survival selling in enormous quantities. Um, those who have tried to play it as like a simulation game generally have not had a lot of positive things to say about it. Um, I, a copy has passed through my hands at one point. If another copy passes through my hands and is in really nice shape, I might even hang on to it. Uh, but otherwise it, it is, I believe, a curiosity. France 1940, German Blitzkrieg in the West. You might say, boy, that cover looks interesting. That is like, uh, unlike all the other Avalon Hill covers in the day. And you'd be right. That's because it's a Redmond Simonson cover of a Jim Dunnigan game design. Um, this was originally published by SPI, and my, it was one of the first of those things to migrate its way to Avalon Hill. I'm not conflating this with something else, am I? I am not. Um, so, uh, this is a this is a hard topic to model. Okay, we talk about this. Um, uh, we talk about this a lot in uh, in the context of Blitzkrieg Legend because OCS actually does a really good job of modeling this conflict. Um, traditionally, I don't know about traditionally, but but often the way to model this con conflict is just to make the Germans really good and the French really bad. And that is a failure. I mean, you might end up getting a historical result out of the end where the Germans sweep their way through to Paris, but it, it's not good modeling um, and I'm not sure how, what the quality of the modeling is here in France 1940. Let me put it that way. 
let me pull up the this thing and pull this over here so I can keep an eye on it. Just make sure everything is kosher and remains so. Status Pro Football. Again, I played that. Um, again, not something I'd probably play right now. Panzer Army Africa. This was another... Uh, was this a Dunnigan design? Uh, this was another SPI game. Uh, it is a Dunnigan design with not a Simonson cover. That looks like a Roger McGowan cover to me, but Bredman Simonson had some involvement in it at some point. Uh, this is one that I don't get talked about a lot back in the day. Um, it, Jeff Anderson, it, it's hard to gain... So there are ways to, to, to model things like operational initiative which is the thing, one of the things that the French lacked in that campaign. And if you're just trying to, you know, ha create a bullets and beans model, then it's going to be difficult to model. Uh, but you need to game that, uh, to, to model that particular campaign well, you need a game that will take into account those intangible factors in the model. Um, moving on, though. Um... Wooden Ships and Iron Men. This is an S. Craig Taylor design from the late, great S. Craig Taylor. Um, this was originally uh, also from Battleline. It is an all-time classic, and it is... Um, Jeff, it's a little hard. It's a little bigger than I go, you go too, though. Uh, but, but that's a that's a that's I think a better a topic best treated uh, as its own topic, right? Rather than just talking about that. Um, Wooden Ships and Iron Men is an all-time classic. It is the classic of Age of Sail warfare. It is a fairly detailed game, maybe not as detailed as the close action of you know more recent years, um, it, but it's you know you're really you 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 the player are running a relatively small number of ships. Um, it is a phenomenal game that I think holds. I mean, assuming that you want a relatively heavy, uh, you know, hex encounter age of sale game you know there's there's an assumption built in there but if you do it is hard it is still hard to beat wooden ships and iron men i have a high opinion of of um a flying colors from gmt and mike nagel um captain c looks pretty good too by the way but i haven't had a chance to check it out yet and i've also played um I've also played Close Action, which plays very much like Starfleet Battles on, on the open sea. Um, but And I, I like Close Action, too, and I own Close Action. I own all of those games. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> it's very difficult for me to say that any of them are superior to Wooden Ships and Iron Men. I'm not sure that they are. Uh, Wooden Ships and Iron Men is an absolute classic, and I would unhesitatingly recommend it today. Witchcraft Ritual Kit. That's just a weird item that they were doing. I don't know what they were thinking. Um, and then we come to, I think, one of the games for which Avalon Hill is best remembered in like the annals of actual play now, which is Russian Campaign. Uh, Russian Campaign is an all-time classic. It is, uh, I think, holds up very well. It's not without its issues, right? Um, but, you know, a lot of those issues um, emerged after thousands of hours of play. So, um, I, I, you know, Russian Campaign, there's a new version coming from... I'm a little unclear as to whether the Jedco... So, Russian Campaign came out of Jedco, okay? And it is... It's a, it's a great game. Um, there is a new version of Russian Campaign, which is a new version of the original Jedco version, uh, just out or about to come out from Compass. And then there is a new edition of Russian Campaign, which has been in the pipeline with GMT for many years. And it seems like it's kind of sort of moving some of the time. Um, so if you're interested in Russian Campaign, um, you should be able to get a copy of Russian Campaign for around $50 to $70 um, on the secondary market. Otherwise, you can pick up the really very nice uh, new version of Russian Campaign from Compass. And we'll have a preview video of that coming at some point as well. Um, 1974 was a really good year for... Um, Avalon Hill. And Vince Reese says that GMT's Russian campaign appears to be vaporware. I don't think that's true, but I can't really argue with it either because it has been, they've been fucking with it for so long now. 
So, uh, you know, at this point, I, I decided I wasn't going to wait, and I went with Russia Besieged as my game in that space. Um, the new version from, or the current, at least, version from Compass. So uh, I think that is a, a game, I haven't had a chance to play it yet, that's a game that looks really good, um, and I will be delighted to play it at some point. Uh, Rise and Decline of the Third Reich. This went through four editions with Avalon Hill. I think it still holds up today. It does have a lot of balance problems that, it again, is are one of those things that emerge after thousands of hours played. Um, and there, you know, people found optimal strategies and stuff like that. Uh, but almost every one of the strategic level World War II games that are Hex Encounter games that have come out since Third Reich have been answers to Third Reich, uh, one way or the other. Some of them mechanically very strongly resemble Third Reich, and some of them don't, but even the ones that don't tend to have been designed in response to Third Reich. So Third Reich is a game that I think holds up really, really well, and also has, I think, a really striking cover, too. Um, Panzer Krieg was from OSG. I, I, I don't recall which it was the original. I think the OSG version was the original of that. Moving on, though, Panzer Leader. So this is basically Panzer Blitz on the West Front. So if you want it as a as a companion to Panzer Blitz, go for it. Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't think. I, I think Panzer Blitz is worth your time to play and try to have had the experience of playing Panzer Blitz. All that applies to Panzer Leader as well. I don't think anybody is really serious about playing Panzer Blitz anymore. Something just popped up that I missed. So let's, uh, now oh, we missed it. Somebody subscribed. So I'm not sure what that was. So hopefully, uh, everything is okay. They did do a computer version of Third Reich, and it actually, at one point, their computer games were a big part of their business, uh, before computer games were a big part of, of business. Um... But in any case, you know, all the stuff I said about Panzer Blitz also applies to Panzer Leader. Uh, Napoleon, the Waterloo campaign. This is a Tom Dog Leash design, and it is an all-time classic as well. This is not the first block war game, but it's a very early block war game, um, and one that is still available now from Columbia Games. Uh, the, in fact, the version pictured here is one of the recent Columbia Games versions rather than one of the old Avalon Hill versions. I'd be curious to handle an Avalon Hill edition of this, actually, because I've handled the, uh, the, the, the Columbia version, and it, it's nice. Um, but it's a, it's a block game, a point-to-point, -point or areas, I forget which, uh, game about the Waterloo campaign. It's really an operational game more than it is about the battle. Um... Kingmaker was an acquisition. This came... Did this come out of Jedco as well? No, I, I think it did, actually. Uh, no, this came out of Ariel, actually. And, and Avalon Hill picked up a couple games from Ariel. Another which I think was Civilization. Um, uh, I've never actually played Kingmaker. I've owned it at a, a couple of different points in my life and have never managed to actually get it played. So at some point, we will definitely have to play Kingmaker. I have played Crown of Roses, which is kind of an answer to Kingmaker. And I do think that... What am I being... What are the notif notification noises coming from? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Um... Uh, but yeah, Kingmaker, total classic. Absolutely. Uh, here is the Chancellorsville 2nd Edition that we talked about before. Uh, I unfortunately don't know the differences between the two, but apparently it's, you know, close to a total redesign. There's the Black Magic Ritual Kit, which is another interesting choice by somebody at Avalon Hill. Um, 1776, Game of the American Revolution. This is a great game um, that I think is a bit underrated today. It's a Mark McLaughlin design. It's quite similar mechanically to his War and Peace in a lot of ways, but it's got some additional tactical wrinkles. Um, it is a quite good game that I actually think holds up fairly well and is a bit underrated nowadays. Uh, Crown of Roses is... I don't know that it's complicated, but, it, but when you start to sit down and play it, 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 the, the rule book overcomplicates a game that's not that complicated. Let me put it that way. 
1776, Doug says that 1776 is too long for what it is. And that's a absolutely fair criticism that I think you can levy against a lot of these early Avalon Hill games. Um, I mean, we're well into the mid period of Avalon Hill games. These are not early Avalon Hill games at this point. I, I consider them early because they're, you know, when I was five or less. But uh, a lot of these take longer to play than you would necessarily expect or find it desirable nowadays. Um, Seventeen seventy six was designed by Randall Reed. Yeah, look at that. That's absolutely right. Where did I get the? Well, maybe maybe it's because of the similarity with War and Peace. That may be why I had the idea in my head that it was um, from Mark McLaughlin. So point corrected. Thank you very much, Jason W. Um, Tobruk. Uh, Tobruk is another one of those games that I think. Probably doesn't hold up very well. I'd be curious to, to see what they've done with the advanced Tobruk system from Critical Hit because Tobruk is basically a, where you, there's a lot of rolling, let me put it that way. Um, and to, to the point where I don't necessarily think it works... I don't think it's a very good mechanic as as deployed in Tobruk. Let me, let me, let me frame that that way. Um, but then, you know, Critical Hit has the advanced Tobruk system, and I guess it fixed some of that. Um, so, to what extent that's true, though, I don't know. I'd be curious if anybody in the chat has any knowledge of the advanced Tobruk system. Stellar Conquest. Uh, we might buzz through a lot of these uh, fantasy and sci-fi games, because that's not our topic tonight. But the ones that I had direct experience of, at least I can touch upon, I loved Stellar Conquest. Um, it is a... Uh, is a bookkeeping heavy game and, and the folks I was playing with back in the day all hated it for that reason. They felt like it was it was like keeping score in, at the bowling alley and you know there's some, some truth to that but uh, I still loved Stellar Conquest. That originally came out of metagaming. Um, I've never seen a copy of the metagaming version of it um, and you know at some point I may well uh, acquire another's copy of Stellar Conquest just for old time's sake. However, a lot of what Stellar Conquest did that was of interest to me is done equally well or better by GMT Space Empires 4X. So, uh, if if you if somebody was looking for a recommendation, should I go run down a copy of Stellar Conquest, I would tell them to go buy Space Empires 4X because I think it, it does just as good a job at this a very similar type of thing as as Stellar Conquest, and it's easier to play. Uh, Frederick the Great, was this a Dunnigan design? Edward Curran and Frank Davis. It wasn't a Dunnigan design, but this did come from SPI. It was originally released, I believe, in, in S&T, uh, and there was a later flat pack version of it. Um, I won't swear to the S&T connection, but I know there was a flat pack because I've got it. Um, and this is considered a classic. You'll notice that uh, BGG... Now, you know, always take the BGG ratings with a grain of salt, right? Um, uh, rated at 523, which is really quite a high rating. So uh, I think that Frederick the Great, you can get a copy of this. What is BGG? Mark? Oh, no, no geek listing on this. That's interesting. Um you should be able to score a copy of Freddy the Great for not a ton of money, though, I, I think. Uh, Caesar's Legions. This is Don Greenwood and Lauren Wiseman, who is uh, going to end up being... Uh, forget the exact timing on this, but right around this time, plus or minus a year, Lauren Wiseman ends up being one of the founding partners at Game Designers Workshop. Uh, and this is the battle... Uh, um, this is a an opera, very interesting game because it fits in a space that there's not a lot of presence in. This is an operational game, an operational ancients game. Um, don't know how fun it is, but it is an interesting piece. Um, uh, the Beat Inflation Strategy game. Have no recollection of that, and look at the rating. It is bad. So there's that. Wargamer's Guide to Panzer Blitz. War at Sea. Um, so War at Sea and Victory in the Pacific kind of form a uh, sort of a matched set, if you will. War at Sea is the Battle of the Atlantic. 
and Victory in the Pacific is the War in the Pacific. Um, and I think I've never played War at Sea. They're pretty much the same system, uh, but I have played Victory in the Pacific, and it's a great game. Um, if you would like a new version of it, get in on Admiral's War from Canvas Temple uh, before that goes out of print again, too. Submarines, another one I'd kind of like to try. Flatbox Avalon Hill game. Um, who was the designer of Submarine? And actually, I want to see who the designer of Stretcher Troopers was. Steve Peak. Interesting. Uh, I believe Steve Peak was... Oh, so this would have come out of Battle Line as well then, because Steve Peak was one of the principals at Battle Line. Um, that's interesting. I'm not sure that I knew that. And then Starship Troopers is a Randall Reed game, actually. Apparently Randall Reed got around a little farther than I thought he did. Um, Starship Troopers, we've talk, kind of talked about a lot since we've talked about science fiction games and, and that kind of thing. I think if you're looking for kind of like a war gamey type infantry treatment, um, I think Starship Troopers is probably the best offer of its era. Uh, but nowadays we do have games like Space Infantry from Lock and Load or whoever does that, um, and those games might be more uh, might be more modern and and might have more appeal to modern tastes. Um, I will say I liked Starship Troopers better than I liked Star Soldier, um, but that's not a very high praise to be honest about. It. I I was I did not find Star Soldier very interesting. Um, Panzer Group of Guderian. This is a... Who designed Panzer Group of Guderian? Dunnigan? Yep, how about that? Okay, so this is another one that came out of s &T, Jim Dunnigan. Um, this is a total classic. Uh, this is an enormously influential design um, that, you know, it, it probably seems a little clunky now, uh, but I think it's worth folks' time to investigate it because it has... Uh, been an enormous influence. Now, a, a question that I have about Seas of Thunder, which I have not played, um, I don't know that it's necessarily all that similar to Victor in the Pacific and War at Sea. Um, but if you, but it will cover the entire war at, at sea. So, so there's that. If you, if you're, if you're into that, then. Uh, David Imperato says he thinks B, VG was better. I'm not. I, I did, I'm losing track of uh, of what that is. So, unless we're talking about victory games in general, in which case, okay. Um, Conquistador: The Age of Exploration. This is a. This is another S, uh, SPI game, uh, originally released in S and T, and it is a game. It, it is a game with very strong colonialism uh, themes. So if you are going to find that distasteful, strongly recommend staying away from Conquistador. Uh, that said, and honestly, it's probably not a great design either, but um, I remembered it with some fondness because I had it as a kid. So I picked it up again and I managed to find an unpunched copy of it. So there's that. Um, Caesar Battle of Elysia. This is, damn it, Chrome. I don't know why that's acting up. This is Robert Bradley design. Wouldn't have picked that name out of the hat. Um, Conquistador is less about exploration than Source of the Nile is, though. It's uh, they're mechanically different enough to warrant uh, an independent discussion. Um, worst game from Victory Games was probably Doctor Ruth's game of Good Sex. I mean, I would think so, but. Uh, anyway, uh, Caesar Battle of Elysia. This, to some people, is still the best Elysia game out there. There is a GBOH Elysia, which is called Elysia, I think. Um, and I have that, and I haven't had a chance to play it yet. So the battle itself is quite interesting. There are videos you can watch about it on YouTube. Essentially, um, Ver Vercingetorix, who is the, the prominent, the preeminent Gallic chieftain, is holed up in this fortress at Elysia. By the way, we are not 100% certain where this was, by the way. Somewhere in Gaul. But uh, Dr. Roots was VG's best-selling game. At some point, we'll do a Victory Games show, too, by the way. Um... 
So uh, Caesar's army lays siege to this Gallic fortress, and then an uh, enormously larger Gallic army shows up. So Caesar builds his own fortifications outside the Gallic fortifications. So there's this kind of like huge Gallic army laying siege to Caesar, who is in turn laying siege to this fortress in the middle. Uh, it's a fascinating military situation, um, and the game itself is very well regarded. Um, Air Force. So Air Force was another battle line acquisition. Um, this was, uh, so there was an expansion for it as well called Dauntless. The battle line version of the expansion, I believe, was standalone, where the, the, the Avalon Hill version of the expansion required you to have Air Force. And the Avalon Hill version of Air Force doesn't look anything like this. I have the Avalon Hill versions of this. It is on my list of things I would like to play at some point. Um, uh, War at Sea 2. I'm not sure what this was. War at Sea 2. Paul Castor and Alan Moon. This was an expansion for War at Sea. Why this gets its own... This is one of those weird, goofy, arbitrary things about BGG. Why that gets its own entry, I don't know. Uh, but here's Victory in the Pacific, which we've already mentioned. It is a, it is a pretty awesome game, and I think... It's another one of those games that takes longer than it should to play. I, I think that's inarguable. Uh, but nevertheless, it's it's a very good game and very influential as well. So, moving right along. Uh, Victory at Sea. What is Victory at Sea? Combines War at Sea and Victory in the Pacific. Again, this does not really warrant its own entry. Um, and of course... <coughs> We were going to get to this sooner or later, of course. Um, squad Leader, right? Uh, maybe the most influential game Avalon Hill did after its initial run of highly influential games in the late 50s and 60s. Um, squad Leader has had an enormous impact on the hobby. Uh, there have been innumerable. I mean, you can even now, we are still seeing a cascade effect of new games that are answers to squad leader um after all these years i personally you know uh, i'm pretty satisfied with asl as an answer to squad leader but there we're, we're still seeing answers to squad leader uh pacific origins this i can tell you what this is this is a uh origins of world war ii variant set in the pacific uh that appeared in the pages of the general at some point i again don't think it deserves its own um entry machiavelli uh this is a kingmaker or diplomacy variant i think maybe i could be nuts about that too yeah it this is not telling me that yeah maybe not maybe it's its own thing somebody will somebody will know victory games worst war game uh, from personal experience, I mean, I didn't try them all, right? And in fact, I tried relatively few of them. But the but the biggest turd that I think they did that I like got to experience was Cold War. Now, to what extent you think that that's even a war game is you know a question you could ask. Um, this is Gettysburg '77. This I believe to be uh, one of the, the the probably the most worthwhile version of Gettysburg. Um, and again, it's a complete redesign of the previous couple of editions of Gettysburg, which were in turn redesigns of the original. Um, Fury in the West this is the Battle of Shiloh game, and this was an acquisition from Battle Line as well. And it's one of the few where Avalon, where Battle Line had it in the flat box, and Avalon Hill redid it in the bookcase box. It's pretty ghastly looking from a graphics perspective, but I have, and this is a Steve Peake design, um, I have had people say that this is a, a very good game. I have, I have heard that said. Um, so, Fury in the West, uh, which you probably can get for a pretty reasonable price as well, thinking about it. I mean, almost all this Avalon Hill stuff, except for the super rare stuff, um, we really it's really not particularly hard to find although some of it you might end up paying a bunch of money for um <clears throat> one example might be flat top um let's look at the flat top card this is a s craig taylor design the late great s craig taylor um and this is i personally think probably the best thing that avalon hill ever published uh flat top is is wonderful um it is a great experience i absolutely suck at it uh it is a great experience and 
I mean, you have to want this kind of experience where it's a, you know, it's kind of double blind and, you know, even if you're not playing with a referee, you still kind of get that double blind experience. John C. from the not-so-sunny Philippines. Ooh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. has just been elected the next president. That's probably not the world's greatest news I've had all day, but okay. Um, but anyway, uh, Flat Top runs $95 for a acceptable condition flat top so that's a <clears throat> it's a little bit pricey but it's also one of the best things that avalon hill ever did um it's you know the kind of game that it is you got to want that kind of game but aside if you do it is the best game of its kind i believe um elric this came out of chaosium originally um designed by charlie crank and greg stafford um this was published originally by chaosium um, and was basically, uh, the map is almost identical to the Chaosium edition, as far as I could tell. So, um, this is an interesting looking game. Um, they used the same map in the Stormbringer RPG, by the way. Um, and this probably goes for neat, decent change as well, by the way. Uh, if you can even find one. Uh, I wouldn't mind having a copy of it, but you know, it's not it's not on my wish list because it's not something I need. Um, D Day Third Edition. This is presumably somewhat different from D the previous editions, but to what extent that's true, I'm not sure. Uh, Dauntless. That's an expansion for Air Force. In the Avalon Hill version, it's an expansion for Air Force. So I think somebody probably already mentioned this. Flat Top is not being reprinted. Uh, I mean, unless you know something that I don't, which is completely possible. There is a Flat Top on steroids coming from Compass called Beneath the Southern Cross or Under the Southern Cross. And that is not a reprint. Uh, you cannot call that a reprint. That is a that is a reimagining. It's, it's going to end up playing quite differently from Flat Top. If, if, it, if the released game resembles what I've seen at Compass Expo. Let me put it that way. Um, so, uh, there was the third game in the Troika of Panzer Blitz, Panzer Leader, and the third game is Arab-Israeli Wars. This extends that system to the Arab-Israeli Wars, and if you are super into Arab-Israeli Wars and want a tactical treatment of it, here you go. John Madison says, oh yeah, John, get on that. That's going to be great. That's going to be great. Definitely, we will uh, make sure that passed around. Compass is working. So Compass isn't reprinting Carrier either. They are doing a new Philippine Sea, and it's Philippine Sea, right? Now, it's it's not the same topic as Carrier. It's not the same game, and it's not a re a reprint. Is uh, is is not what it is. It's a it's a new game in the series of Carrier, if you like. That makes sense. Alpha Omega, I think this came from Battle Line as well. Yes, it did. Uh, it, and I say that because it was it's got a very Battle Line looking box. Um, never played that. Air Assault on Crete. This is another one I never played. It's it's a fairly big, fairly detailed game. I'd probably like it. Um, except that I already have a couple of games on the invasion of Crete um, that probably cover it to the uh, extent that I need coverage of that topic. Let me put it that way. But there is the uh, Invasion of Malta little side game in it as well. So, hey, John C., if you have to stay with them, I mean, they're they're nice fellas, and, and you uh, will certainly have plenty of gaming to do. So that works. Sources of the Nile. This is the other, you know, colonialism-heavy Avalon Hill game of the period. Uh, and again, this I think is a, is is a, a pretty good game, uh, very narrative heavy, but it it is you know rich with themes of colonialism. And if you're gonna if you're gonna have an issue with that, it is probably a title you need to stay away from. Um, I don't have any problem with people wanting to play Source of the Nile, but we should acknowledge that you know it has it is built in problematic ways in a lot of ways. So. Smokers Wild and Drinkers Wild. These were acquisitions from somebody else, too, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Gamma 2. That was... <laughs> that was uh, Gamma 2 is what turned into Columbia Games. Uh, so they did Smokers Wild and Drinkers Wild, which supposedly did not endorse those activities. So, um, 
Seven Cities of Gold was an early computer game from, I believe, Electronic Arts, uh, which I really liked at the time. Um, and, and I might have liked it at the time because of my ex previous experience with, uh, with uh, Conquistador, actually. Uh, here's Panzer Creek. This is the one that was originally published. You can see it's got a cover that looks really un Avalon Hill like. Uh, and this was originally released from um, OSG, believe it or not. Uh, this is John Prado's design, and then it got picked up by Avalon Hill. Um, and it's might even still be around, for all I know. Panzer Leader 1940. Again, these are just general articles. Uh, Napoleon at Bay, the campaign in France. So of there are a couple of uh, operational Napoleonic titles designed by Kevin Zucker that were released by Avalon Hill. And Napoleon at Bay is probably the best of them. Um, the cover, on the other hand, I'll, I'll pull this. This cover is something else. Um, and I'm going to pull this up just to show you this cover. It's something else. Um, I don't know who did this cover art. I mean, it might have been Tom Shaw's kid or something like that. It's really bad. It, it, this might be the worst... Um, the worst cover Avalon Hill ever did. It's bad. The game's pretty good, however. So uh, it is a game that hold, I think holds up pretty well and is not hard to get in some edition or other. OSG has done a version of it as well, and I think somebody else might have as well, uh, to be honest. You could do that in Source of the Nile. Yes, you absolutely... I mean, it's still a colonialism game, right? But you're not playing the colonizer, necessarily. Um, and that does give you a little more flexibility with uh, with approach in Source of the Nile that you don't have with something like Conquistador. So, again, I have no problem with people playing those games. Engage with... But, you know, th that's supposed to make you engage with the subject, too, right? And if you do that, then... Okay, good. Um, copies of Napoleon at Bay can be found for under $30 unpunched on eBay monthly, so says Grumbling Grogner. I picked mine up. I'm not sure it was quite that cheap, but I did get an unpunched copy of one of the OSG versions. Um, it's worth it's worth your time, and of all of the... Uh, it's, a, it's a really good campaign at, that, at its scale, too. Let me put it that way. So it's the France 1814 campaign uh, where Napoleon's on the run. He's got multiple huge allied armies uh, closing in on Paris, uh, which he has to protect from them. Uh, Fortress Europa. I don't remember who designed this. John Edwards, Richard Hamblin, Ellen R. Moon. Okay. Fort, did, did this come out of Jedco? It did. Yeah, that's not a surprise, actually. <clears throat> so Fortress Europa is another one of these. Um, I, I think it's a fairly good game it, it's it's a it's a good game for exploring the strategic options available for the d-day invasion um where you you know you want to land in Brittany or you want to land in southern france you can do those things in <coughs> fortress europa that said it takes longer to play than it should um <coughs> there is also on the topic, well, we'll get we'll get to it. We'll get to the other ones actually. There's a couple more of those Zucker Napoleonic operational games that are going to come at some point here. Uh, here's Drinker's Wild, uh, Cross of Iron expansion for Squad Leader, Class Struggle, which has a, a pretty hilarious Monty Python esque cover. I think I think we all have to have a chortle over this cover. Uh, but other than that, I got nothing to say about it. Uh, Bismarck Second Edition. We've already touched on that. Uh, Air Force Dauntless Expansion Kit, Wizard's Quest. This is another fantasy game. I've never played this, uh, nor owned it. A uh, variety of other sports games. Samurai, Game of Politics and Warfare in Feudal Japan. This is a Battle Line game. And I want to say this is one that Battle Line did in a bookshelf box and that Avalon Hill did in a uh, book bookshelf box. But I could be wrong about that. Is this the Battle Line version? This makes it look like not a bookshelf box. Yeah, it totally doesn't. Um, who was the designer here? Dan Campagna. 
Okay, I've never heard of Dan Campagna, to be honest about it. Um, but that might be an interesting game. I can't, I, I can't tell you anything about it. Naval War was one of those little mini box games. It's, a, I believe, a card game. Um, and it's kind of one of those things that you still see pop up at like WBC as a side game. Um, that Atlantic Storm, that kind of thing. Um, Magic Realm. This was a Richard Hamblin? Yeah, Richard Hamblin design. Uh, very complicated, even in its day. Well, I should say, I mean, it, it was considered very complicated at the time. Um, and it's kind of one of those games that at, where Avalon Hill's trying to kind of break into this new RPG thing without really understanding what this whole new RPG thing is really doing um there's there's a lot of those kinds of games that pop up in the in the very late 70s but even up to maybe 81 um from avalon hill and spi and a variety of other publishers um i would kind of like to try magic realm at some point but uh it's it, it goes for a lot of money there's print and play versions of it floating around you could download all the stuff um, and I am, I, I do not have all the markers done for Barbarossa Army Group Setter here, but I just clipped the last units and that's as far as we're getting. I'll clip the rest of the markers. There's a, about a sheet and a little more of markers, uh, to go. And I'll, I'm going to have to do a counter reorg. Um, we already, yeah, so they, they did do mini games like a lot of these other publishers did as well. Where are the... Let's see here. Uh, so uh, it's it's my belief that probably Magic Realm is, is probably not worth your time of, of following it, it up now. Although, you know, I'm willing to have my mind changed about that. Fanstein says that the next game on the list is his... Best of Avalon Hill War Games, The Longest Day. Um, so this is one of the true monsters that Avalon Hill did. Uh, with mounted maps and everything, because that's that's what you did back then. Um, it is a noteworthy game in a lot of ways. Um, I have to say, I don't really think it holds up all that well. Um, so I don't know that I think it's worth... Okay, so there's a caveat here. It's a, it's a battalion level Normandy game. Okay, so so bear that in mind. Um, and if you're looking for a battalion level Normandy game, there's not that many options to choose from. One of them is the longest day. Now it does use the German counter symbols, which is a an interesting choice and one which I think doesn't do anything but get in the way in the case of the longest day. Um, and I say that because. I don't think it really adds anything. I mean, it's a cool feature, but it doesn't. It adds mechanical weight for no simulation value. Um, it would have been just easier for them to use the standard wargaming counter symbols, and people wouldn't have had to try and memorize the German count, the, the period counter symbols. Um, in the longest day. Uh, GMT's Battle for Normandy is battalion level, as is uh, Atlantic Wall, either version of Atlantic Wall. Uh, but but that's kind of, and uh, Overlord and Killing Ground is kind of battalion level as well. Um, but that's kind of it. And there's not that many games in that space. There's a few, but not that many. I think... I think you're better off with, while not a perfect game, I believe you're better off with a GMT's Battle for Normandy than you are with The Longest Day. Um, and and maybe also Killing Ground and Overlord, but those are expensive. So uh, you can get a copy of Battle... Well, you, Battle for Normandy is expensive too, but there is a new version of it coming. Um, Little Round Top. This was called 20th Main when OSG did it, I believe. Yeah. Uh, this is David G. Martin and Leonard Millman. Um... And it's Little Round Top. It's, you know, that whole end of, of Gettysburg. Here's the map. Um, so I'm not sure if I ever had this or not. I'm, I might not have. Uh, it kind of looks familiar, but I might be thinking of the, the, the Waterloo game that they did as well. 
Um, uh, mostly the people I, I, I mean, I, I, there are some people that swear by the longest day. So, so bear that in mind, right? You know, don't, don't assume I'm right about everything because I'm not. Uh, GTS games do use the German symbols. However, the symbol means nothing. <laughs> All the other important information is on the counter. If you, you look at the color behind the firepower and the color behind the movement, that tells you everything you need to know about how the move, how the unit behaves. So the, the in the case of GTS, it, it doesn't... They use historical unit symbols, uh, which are different for the for the Allies as well, but they're more familiar. But the Allied ones are a little more familiar because those got developed eventually into na- what we call NATO symbols. Um, but the, the symbols don't mean anything. You don't have to memorize them. It's just neat that they're on there in the case of GTS. So it actually works. Um, uh, somebody says, uh, Mike Anthony says, Robin Hood was originally OSG. Um, maybe. Joe Bissio. But you're right. It was originally OSG. And in fact, it says OSG on that cover. William Aarons, thank you so much. Uh, William asks, what present day company producing war games has either been the most influenced by Avalon Hill or can be said to have the most titles that Avalon Hill first developed? Um, most, uh, every wargaming company now has been massively influenced by Avalon Hill. I believe that is safe to say. I think, without actually doing a count, I suspect that the 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 the, the company that has the most Avalon Hill stuff that they have done is probably Multiman. Uh, the bulk of that is going to be ASL, Greek Campaigns, the American Civil War, and a couple of Panzer Blitz things that they've done. Um, other than that, uh, C- Compass is now uh, several things. A, you know, a few things have come out from Hasbro, but not very much. Um, but I, I think if we kind of look at the kind of company that Avalon Hill was, I mean, we are war gamers. We are going to see a war gaming company when we look at Avalon Hill. The closest thing that we have to that right now is GMT. GMT, we see a war gaming company, and when we see them doing games that we don't perceive as war games, we get sore about it sometimes. Uh, but Avalon Hill always, as we continue to see going through this product list, always produced non-war games as well. And we haven't even gotten into the RPG stuff yet. That's coming up in a couple of years. Um, So uh, these little tiny mini box games from Avalon Hill are highly portable. Uh, I do have 100 Days Battle was given to me at Compass Expo by a viewer. Thank you very much. Um, And one of these days, we will do some video on that. It is very small, but it's on one of those super poachy uh, Avalon Hill boards. Um, I believe so. Streets of Stalingrad uses it too. Uh, But to what extent it's necessary to memorize it, that's the question, right? Um, uh, Jeff Beeler asked if anybody here has is, was witness to an SPI versus Avalon Hill softball game at Origins. Would have, would have been neat to see, actually. Um, uh, Doug, you'd think so, but, you know, I've been wrong about that before. Um, okay, so moving on, though. Freedom in the Galaxy. This is a favorite of mine, actually. It's a John Butterfield design. It's a really neat game. It's got really rather a nice background. This is another one of those things that plays as a lot like a RPG board game type of thing, and it is again in that sort of slot from seventy eight to make eighty eighty one or so, where wargaming companies were trying to cash in on the 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 fantasy wargaming thing that they were seeing by doing. Games that looked more like war games than RPGs, but that had RPG elements. Freedom of the Galaxy was one of those. It is really quite a neat game. It is, uh, you know, as I've said before, it, it, if somebody was doing that now, they would in no way design it like that. Uh, if John Butterfield probably wouldn't design it like that nowadays. But despite that, it's a pretty neat game. Uh, Dune. This was designed by, I think, some of the co-designers of Cosmic Encounter. And uh, this is a great game. Not, you know... Not a war game in any meaningful sense, in my opinion, uh, but it is nevertheless a great multiplayer game and can be a lot of fun. It can also end in... It's one of those games that can end in half an hour or it might take eight hours to play. Uh, 
Oh, Joe Perez played in those games. Awesome. Circus Maximus. Uh, I picked this. This has a great reputation. I picked this up. Uh, this came to me in the in the uh, the Dead Gamers Estate stuff a couple of years ago. I haven't had a chance to play it yet. Um, interestingly, I just picked up um, Monster Coliseum for RuneQuest, another Avalon Hill product, which looks very much like Circus Maximus for for RuneQuest. It's it's a weird product in a lot of ways. War and Peace is a Mark McLaughlin game. Um, Arcola, the Battle for Italy. This is a Zucker game. Uh, this is uh, Northern Italian Campaign in 1796, and it is, uh, I think, yeah. So this is, wait a minute. So this says there's an Avalon Hill version of this, but I, I will tell you this. This is not the Avalon Hill version. This is the big three-map version that Zucker did. I'd love to have this actually, but uh, uh, the if we look at the versions on this, this is another one of those things where BGG is going to kind of let us down. Uh, so this OSG edition from '79 uh, is a very different with the three maps is a very different game than this Battle for Italy, uh, which is a little mini box game um, with uh, you know uh, an eight and a half by eleven map. So, these are not the same game. Bad BGG for putting these together. Uh, okay, War and Peace. Uh, War and Peace is a classic. It's, uh, it's, it plays really well. The campaign's pretty busted. Remains pretty busted. The new version from One Small Step's really nice. Um, highly recommend playing the, camp the operational scenarios. The... Um, the uh, camp... The, the grand campaign where you play the entire entirety of the napoleonic wars is really still pretty busted um titan uh titan is a design from dave trampier the legendary DD artist and jason McAllister. um this is a very nice game actually i've played this more than once um it takes a long time it's another one of these things that really takes a long time um there is a newer version of it from is this Valley Games did the newer version of it. And unfortunately, you know, I expected this, but Valley Games got rid of all the amazing Dave Trampier art. Uh, the cool thing about the original art on this was every one of these little... So say you had... I'm not sure how well you're going to be able to see this. On, what the shit? I'm not sure how well you're going to be able to see this. Uh, but let's say you have these trolls. Every one of those trolls is different, actually. Um... It does take forever. That's an absolutely legitimate um, criticism of Titan. It takes forever to play. It's it's like a six to nine hour game, um, and and this kind of game shouldn't take that long. But it, oh, I would say it's welcome. Kilroy was Kilroy was here. Uh, thank you. That is exactly right. No, that's a that's completely fair. It it does take way 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 longer than it should to play. Somebody needed to come up with uh, a streamlined short version of the game. Uh, the Mystic Wood. I have no comment about that. I have nothing, no information on it. Dragon Pass, however, was uh, originally a Chaosium game called White Bear and Red Moon, uh, re-released by Avalon Hills. Greg Stafford design. Not sure if Stafford is the only designer on that. This probably lists Robert Corbett yeah, as uh, as a co-designer. I'm not sure if that's actually true, but then I've never had either version of this game pass through my hands. Um, so it is set in the world of Glorantha, the RuneQuest world. So um, it is uh, I interesting. I'd actually kind of like to see it at some point. Uh, Devil's Den, 1980. This is uh, kind of late. So we're starting to get into late period Avalon Hill here now. Uh, this is David Martin and Leonard Millman. It's got pretty nice cover. Um, it's got pretty nice counters, I think, for its era. And uh, I otherwise can't really say much about it. Um, Civilization. This is another one that came out of Ariel, if I'm not mistaken. And Triton Titan's not really broken. It just takes too long. Um, Civilization also takes too long. <laughs> That's absolutely true. That's I, I we 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 started with this right um, as as with the statement that a lot of these classic era Avalon Hill games really take longer than they should. 
Um, and Civ is absolutely one of those games, particularly if you play with the advanced Civ, which frankly I wouldn't want to play without, um, but if uh, it, it makes the game take even longer. And you really want at least five people, and eight is better. It is a better game with, with six or eight people than it is with four or five. Um, it's a great game. It's uh, highly recommended. It is still floating around, um, but it does take a long time. Um, Storm of Arnhem. Uh, Area Impulse. This is I might be the first of the Area Impulse games. Uh, it's a classic. Uh, people still play it and admire it today. Even as late as '81, Avalon Hill was still doing these dreadful sports-looking games called like Pro Golf, Hitler's War. Um, this is uh, something that came out of metagaming. Again, I've never seen the metagaming version of this, and I've never played the Avalon Hill version, uh, but it is a like super-duper high-level World War II in Europe game. Let's see if I can get you a look at the map. Um, this is the map. So, uh, I mean, you know, it's... The granularity is coarse, right? Um, so... It, Matt Taylor, you're playing faster than I think most people do, if that's the case. Um, I, but again, if you're playing it regularly, yeah, you're probably going to play it faster. So so that is, a, uh, that is a thing. And Doug is correct in that the Civilization board games, uh, this Civilization game from Avalon Hill, is not very similar to any of the Civilization computer games. That's absolutely right. Um... So Hitler's Wars, uh, Callendale seemed to like this, so you know, take that for what it's worth. Uh, the Guns of August. This is another one of those games that ruined World War One as a topic for a long time for a lot of people. Um, it is a fairly historical and quite dry treatment of World War One that once again, Rob Bama, Frank Davis takes a lot longer than it ought to to. Well, it, it, not necessarily. It's it's actually I think a pretty good simulation, but it's 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 a slog to play. Um, um, see, I, I tend not, Vince, I tend not to use the word broken because I mean, when I use it, I mean broken. Like we are stopping dead at this, on this game because this is busted. It flatly does not work. Uh, so I tend not to use that. Fiddly is a game that is a word that everybody kind of defines on their own. Um, so I mean, uh, games with uh, you know that take longer to play are not bro long are not broken. They just take longer to play. Maybe they take longer than you wanted. Gladiator is a game about man-to-man -man combat in an arena. So, you know, Av somebody at Avalon Hill really liked Ben Hur apparently. Uh, Down with the King, which is a fantasy game, which I can't really say too much about, and I think is not considered a, a classic. Bulge eighty one. I don't know that it is a classic, but I think it's probably a pretty decent uh, bulge game. Uh, at at its intended uh, you know level, hitting a, it's on its intended beats, if you know what I'm saying, if that makes any sense. I mean, if it's it's not intended to be a, a masterpiece bulge simulation, right? It's intended to be an easy, accessible bulge game, and I think it succeeds at that. Um, B17, Queen of the Skies, 1981. This is a classic. This is uh, the progenitor of an entire. Um, genre of what we call narrative solo games nowadays and it is uh you know famous for not really giving you the opportunity to make many decisions as the player some of its uh its revisitors have have tried to address that um but yeah absolutely it is an extremely influential game amoeba wars I've seen the box. Don't know that I ever owned it. Don't know that I was ever interested in it. Wizards is another one of the fantasy games that I never got. Uh, Struggle of Nations I have. This is a, a Kevin Zucker Operational Napoleonics game, and this is the Leipzig campaign. Uh, it's an interesting topic, but it uses these really tiny hexes, and then there are these like really tiny rectangular counters, and it's, it's really kind of a pain in the nuts to deal with. And it's on that bad Avalon Hill map board stock that, that bows tremendously. So I think there's a lot of interesting things happening in the Struggle of Nations. And it's basically the same system as, more or less, as uh, Napoleon at Bay. <clears throat> but like the, the physical pieces are such that kind of adds a lot of extra trouble to to the game 
and I don't know that it's worth anybody's time. Let's just check, uh, make sure we're doing okay here. We're doing okay. All right. <clears throat> Slapshot. This, uh, this came out from... I don't know why that's not working. This came from Tom Dog Leash. I don't know that I really remember the Avalon Hill version of this much, to be honest. I did know it was from uh, Columbia Games. I mean, they are Canadians, after all. Gunslinger. Very handsome box on Gunslinger, and the pieces were pretty neat, too. And this is kind of a an interesting piece, but it's like a man-to-man -man gunfighting game, and I don't know. We did talk... We're covering these, Dale, in alphabetical order. So, um... So, yes, we did cover Panzer Group of Guderian. Uh, G.I.N. of the Victory, which, of course, is a squad leader expansion. Dragon Hunt, another fantasy game that I didn't get into. Up front, classic game. Uh, it, it was kind of marketed as the squad leader card game, uh, but it... Um, no, we are doing chronological... Reverse chronological order would be now back to 1954. Chronological order is we're going from 1954 54 in the same direction that time flows um, up to now or up to 1998 or whenever they went away um, but I mean there was a famous of course upfront Kickstarter that shat the bed um, so and I think we all know about that but you can buy basically a complete set of upfront from uh, Wargame Vault uh, print on demand stuff and basically it's kind of pricey but I don't know that it's much pricier than uh, Wargame is nowadays Here's a 25th anniversary version uh, of Tactics. Tactics and Tactics 2 and Blitzkrieg were all games in like this fictional land of red versus blue um, and, you know, unmoored from anything resembling history. Uh, that doesn't appeal to me. Empires in Arms this is a Harry Rowland design originally from the Australian Design Group um, and which we might see another edition from Australia Design Group at some point. Um... Well, the Schlieffen plan part is the part where things move, so that makes sense, Perfidious Albion. Um, Empires in Arms is a, is a, is an absolute classic, and I think we're going to try to play it as a side game at Winterfest this coming year. That should be cool. Uh, Bull Run. This, I believe, was a game that sat in the can for something like 10 or 15 or 20 years uh, before it finally released, and it's got a nice cover, uh, but I'm told it very much resembles a game from the late 60s uh, in d terms of design. Uh, can't really give you any more info about that. We're starting to get into the Avalon Hill stuff that I can't tell you much about, actually. Firepower is one of those. This is a tactical Vietnam game, I think. Am I right about that? Uh, no, since 1965. So, organization, weapons, and equipment, and tactics of many of the world's nations since 1965. So, generic, modern, S. Craig Taylor. You know, it's probably worth looking at as, a, as an S. Craig Taylor design. Uh, expansions for Dune. Bonsai, which was, I believe, an expansion for Upfront. Yellowstone, which looks not interesting. Um, but we're going to start also start get to get into a huge amount of ASL stuff, which we're really not going to cover. Russian Front, uh, an attempt to make lightning strike twice, uh, but it is it is not considered as strong a game as Russian Campaign. Dark Emperor, which is another fantasy game, which actually has some some fans. Uh, ASL stuff. Uh, Platoon, the movie tie-in game Platoon. A very interesting uh, title there, I suppose. Uh, it was interesting that Avalon Hill did such a licensed title, let me put it that way. Uh, Kremlin. This is a card game, and it's been reproduced several times, and has been changed fairly dramatically all the different times. I think the latest version has like all the versions in it, something like that. Uh, Flight Leader. That's a modern jet air combat game, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Civilization Extension. Britannia. This is Lupulcifer's design. Uh, it is a design that holds up pretty well. 1830 is an 18xx game. This, and I had this, and I played it actually, and it's I liked it. Um, Thunder at Casino, that is a, a area impulse game. Uh, Tack Air, don't know much about that. Raid on Saint Nazaire is, I believe, a solitaire game um, on the Raid on Saint Nazaire. 
Uh, so that's definitely uh, probably something that you might want to take a look at if you are into solitaire stuff, as is Patton's Best, which is a game that a lot of people still like. Quest for the Ideal Mate with the, with the Torrid Romance Cover Cover. Uh, Knights of the Air, which was probably an attempt to redo Ricky's War. Um, that is World War... This is... Is this World War One or World War Two? That's World War One. Okay. Um, Dinosaurs of the Lost World. I don't even remember that clearly. Um, Spices of the World. This was released in collaboration with McCormick, if I'm not mistaken. Merchant of Venus. I had this. I tried to play it. it I was baffled by it. Uh, Gettysburg 88. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, a lighter version of Gettysburg than Gettysburg 77. Enemy in Sight. We're well past the uh, the Avalon Hill Classics period now, by the way. Uh, but we might as well finish the list. Enemy in Sight looks like an Age of Sail game, actually. Neil Schaffler. Schlaffer? Schlaffer? Interesting. It's a card game. Okay. Turning Point Stalingrad expansion. Uh, and Turning Point Stalingrad. Another uh, area impulse game. Siege of Jerusalem. A lot of people love this game. I can't really comment on it. I haven't played it. But a lot of people love that game. Napoleon's Battles. This is maybe Avalon Hill's only attempt to do miniatures rules. Um, and never really caught on. But, you know, you should really take the word of the miniatures people and not me. So there's that. Uh, MBT, that is modern main battle tank. It is a modern game, um, and I never got into it. It's now available again from GMT. Uh, Desert War. Republic of Rome, that's a great, not a war game at all, really, but it's a great game. New World, which I never played. Mustangs, I remember that, and Midway in the flat box. This is very different game than the original Midway. Legends of Robin Hood and History of the World. I played History of the World. It's another one of those that it's a good game actually, but it takes longer to play than it should. D Day ninety one, um, very different from their original D Day. You see a theme here. Blackbeard. This is the this is a Richard Berg game. It's very different from the GMT Blackbeard, which is basically a complete redesign. And I, for my money, this is an interesting game where the GMT Blackbeard is not. Uh, MMP is not doing a reprint of Siege of Jerusalem. What they are doing is a game called Storm Over Jerusalem, which is an area impulse treatment of the Siege of Jerusalem. So it is literally a completely different game on the same topic. That is not a reprint. Um, Battle of the Bulge, Bulge 91. We keep coming back to this. This is a very simple game from what I understand. Uh, Attack Sub. A lot of people liked Attack Sub, actually. Advanced Civ, which is an expansion for Civ. Oh, yeah, here we start getting into Stonewall Jackson's Way. This is great campaigns of the American Civil War. Brilliant Joe Balkowski design. Fantastic. Uh, fantastic. Yes. Now, Compass is planning to do a designer signature Siege of Jerusalem. I don't want to use the word reprint there because I don't know what their intentions are with that. Um, reprint implies that it's going to be more or less the same game. And, and maybe that's true. I just don't know. I don't have any details of that. Um, Guadalcanal. Uh, again, very different from the old Guadalcanal. Global Survival. I remember this game, but I don't remember it being from Avalon Hill. Um, Gangsters. I think that might have been a card game. Breakout Normandy, Area Impulse game. Advanced Third Reich that massively increased the complexity level of a game that was already supposed to be really complex. The fleet games are victory games, yes. So they will not be in this list. Uh, we the People, this is Mark Herman game. Uh, but the, the progenitor of the modern card-driven war game is right here in 1993. Roadkill, this is pretty much Car Wars slash Mad Max. Car Wars is already kind of Mad Max. Um... Uh, Grumbly Grognard says that Gangsters is a board game, uh, not a card game. Point, point taken. Uh, and Doug says that Napoleon's Battles is a better rule set for the era for Napoleonic miniatures, but the people who like Empire didn't like it, apparently. This is all not a not-my-thing thing, so I'm going to take whoever sound, sounds authoritative's word for it. 
on that. If, if I need to know, I'll ask Jim Ozarski. Um, a roadkill. Uh, Roads to Gettysburg, classic great campaigns in the American Civil War. IDF, Israeli Defense Force, uh, that is either a companion or an expansion to MBT. I think it's a companion. I think it was standalone. Um, here come the Rebels, on, again, great campaigns in the American Civil War. Assassin, which was definitely a card game. Um, Napoleon's Battles Module 2. Maharaja, I think this might have been the diplomacy in ancient India thing. Yeah, I think so. I think that's correct. I don't know. I never played this either, obviously. Uh, no, this is based on Britannia rather than diplomacy. That's right. I never played Britannia either. So if I had played it, I'd have a, a better handle on its derivative games. Gorilla. Um, I actually picked this up off of eBay for about 10 bucks about six months ago. Um, I'd kind of like to try it. Obviously, it is colonial diplomacy that is the game I'm thinking of that is a derivative of diplomacy rather than all of these other things that I have called derivatives of diplomacy. Stonewall in the Valley, Jackson's Valley Campaign, that's a great game. Uh, London's Burning, which is a Battle of Britain game, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, who designed this? Ben Knight. I didn't just cock that up, did I? No, good, okay. All right, and we're on the last page here now. This is the, the end of the line for Avalon Hill. Geronimo, um, interesting looking game, actually, um, by, by Richard Berg on the in, some facet of the Indian Wars. Um, looks a little bit fussy, but, you know, I kind of like fussy. So at some point, if I manage to stumble across a copy of that, I will be happy to grab it. Empire of the Rising Sun, which is the companion to... Um, Avalon Hill's advanced Third Reich in, you know, the Pacific uh, Companion 2. Not an entirely successful game, I, I believe. Um, Stonewall's Last Battle. Uh, Hannibal, Rome versus Carthage. This is a Mark Simonich, credited to Mark Simonich and Richard Berg, but it's a Simonich design with some ideas from Berg. Um, Avalon Hill did do Rail Baron, but I probably blew past it because I'm focusing on war games. Age of Renaissance, which I think I played, but I could be wrong about. Successors. Um, this is a game that's still floating around. Phalanx, I think, has done a lot about recent, like three years ago. They did like a Kickstarter to do a new edition of it. And I think it just started coming out in the last six or eight months or something like that. Here's a revision of Starship Troopers, which um, <clears throat> I think was more of a movie tie-in on the... I mean, certainly these are images reminiscent of images from the movie. We could really do... I could probably do a whole show and talk for an hour about Starship Troopers, the book, versus Starship Troopers, the movie. But that that is not tonight. Uh, Princess Ryan's Star Marines. This has apparently got a sterling reputation. Um, Kremlin Expansion, Atlantic Storm. That's got a lot of fans still. Um... On to Richmond, one of the very last things that they did. For the People, um, which is another Mark Herman game. And it is it is the game in which the the Mark Herman uh, card-driven war game mechanism reaches its final form, if you will. Not its final form, but its final form. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it reaches full maturity here at in For the People. Um, and then Bitter Woods. I want to say that like the very last thing they did may have been Doom Battalions, but I could be wrong about that. Stellar Horizons is a very good multiplayer game. Um, I love Stellar Horizons. It, it also takes longer to play than it should. I, I think that's a fair criticism. Uh, and it, the footprint is enormous, but um, it uh, <clears throat> it's a very good game. I enjoyed playing it tremendously. So, all right. We have about 20 minutes left. Let's see what I have left in the outline. If I if I missed anything, I, I might have. I took that took a lot longer than I expected, but that's okay. Um, I think we got it all set up. All right, so I'm gonna we'll go for another 20 minutes at least. Uh, what were the golden years of Avalon Hill? Boy, that 74 looks like a really really strong year from Avalon Hill. Just looking at the dates. I mean, Perfidious Albion, to, to some extent, 
I, I I don't think that's that's a conscious policy on the point of on the part of Hasbro. So I forget what game we're talking about, but somebody wanted to know who holds the rights to Avalon Hill, such and such a title now. And so they started with Hasbro, and they contacted Hasbro's legal department, and they said, "We don't know. We we might have the right. I don't know. We don't have. We don't know." So um, the Avalon Hill RPGs, you know, we might do that actually. Um, and in fact, one of the things I'd like to do is a video on. So Avalon Hill did four RPGs plus the one RPG that. That Victory Games did so. So Victory Games did James Bond 007, which is a tremendously influential and and clever RPG design. Um, they they did a tremendous support for it. It is a great RPG. Um, that said, I was not the world's biggest fan of it, just because I'm not that big of James a James Bond fan. I was a bigger James Bond fan at the time. Um, Avalon Hill did um, Powers and Perils. Lords of Creation, uh, Rune Quest in the Rune Quest Third Edition, and Tales from the Floating Vagabond, and they were working on a game called Rune Quest Slayers uh, as they were handed off the handing off the keys to Hasbro, and Hasbro instantly killed it. Um, I have probably as much experience with Powers and Perils as almost anybody, except for those Dutch guys that are still playing it. There's like one group somewhere in Europe, in Denmark or the Netherlands, that actually still plays Powers of Perils. Uh, I pl played it a, a little, I ran it a little bit back in like the mid 80s, right? So I, I had some experience with it and I've looked through it. I think there's some legitimately terrific ideas in it. Um, overall, it is not a game I would attempt to play now, I don't think, except possibly as an experiment. Um, I do think that. RuneQuest 3rd Edition is a underrated version of RuneQuest. Uh, but it was not developed by Avalon Hill. It was developed by Chaosium. And then uh, some of the support was... The support went from good to, to terrible to non-existent to very good. Um, so it, it, I could get an entire video on the story of support for RuneQuest 3 from Avalon Hill. Um I, you know, just kind of started, as you might notice from the shelf there, I just kind of started picking. A lot of the stuff is just stuff that wasn't shelved until earlier today. But uh, some of the stuff showed up today. What what showed up today was these three things and this, which is Mongoose Rune Quest 2, which I didn't have, which is the better of the two Mongoose editions, although it's not really worth, worth it, but it's, you know, I wanted at least the core book for reference, so... Commando was SPI, and Commando was kind of a um, a hybrid game, I would say. Uh, so was Swords and Sorcery, though. So, uh, Rob Johnson, that is that is a dumb strategy <laughs> if you're trying to run a business and trying not to get sued. Um, the the thing is though that, that you can basically if you change the name and rewrite the rules and re do your own graphics you can absolutely reprint if you you wanted to reprint i mean again consult an ip lawyer right don't take my word for it but the fact is that if i wanted to do you know redo a couple of these are bad examples because they're like in print now from companies that are around but if i wanted to redo you know geronimo uh, and I rewrote the rules, and I redid the map, and called it something different. I could probably get away with doing my own version of it. Now, is that worth my time? Probably not, to be honest. I mean, we just went through like 400 items, right? And, and to be honest, you know, a number of those things are still around. They're not hard to get, Avalon Hill games particularly. So, so they're, you know, right there... The secondary market, Avalon Hill kept stuff around for a long time. Most Avalon Hill product is really easy to get. John Carter is another game I would consider a bit of a hybrid, too. Good good, good catch on that. Um, John Stanley, thanks for stopping by. Um, RPGs from Wargaming Companies is an interesting topic. Now, SPI did three true RPGs and a couple of things that were hybrids, like Commando and and John Carter, and maybe one or two others, and Freedom of the Galaxy, for that matter. Um, but they did three true RPGs. One was Universe, which was a... 
I believe a John Butterfield design, actually, at least a co John Butterfield co-design. Um, and um, there was Dragon Quest, which is, I believe, a Jerry Klug design. And Dragon Quest is actually a, quite a good game. Um, and then the, the infamous Dallas RPG, which, what were they even thinking? Um... Jeff Beeler asks, what were the effects of Avalon Hill buying other companies' designs? So for a long time, that was actually much more how Avalon Hill acquired games rather than designing them in-house. Uh, that is absolutely uh, the case. Yes, Brent, Brand, well, actually, I should mention that. Um, or Enterprise Games is uh, coming to Origins. They're repping GMT there, but if they have Avalon Hill stuff, you want to uh, call them up or reach out to them and uh, they'll bring the stuff with them to Origins, and you can pick it up there and not have to pay shipping. So bear that in mind. Patrick, thanks for stopping by. I actually like Olive Loaf, but I apparently am alone in that. Um, sniper, yeah, that's eh, Firefight City Fight, maybe two, maybe. Uh, Mike Anthony asks about using squad leader math for RPGs. I've never done that, but I've certainly, you know, hey, I got if I got stuff, I'll leverage war game components into an RPG. I got no problem with that at all. Just I've never used squad leader maps particularly. So probably would like to have a copy of SPI's Dragon Quest again. It's one I got rid of. That was dumb. I shouldn't have done that. Um I did reacquire universe last year sometime um and it's less worthwhile as a game on its on its own merits um than than dragon quest uh but it does have some pretty neat ideas in it too mm. we are way behind on the scotch drink and we did too much talking tonight Ah, okay. Brant says Firefight City Fight were fire teams, not not, not individuals. Uh, boy, I would actually, I'd be, I'm in no sense inclined to go buy a copy of a Dallas RPG, but I would be curious to leaf through that product just to see, kind of try to figure out what they were thinking. How did Avalon Hills buying other companies' designs affect those companies? Well, in most cases, they were companies that were divesting themselves of their board games. So, for example, uh, Battleline was a division of Heritage Models, and they decided at some point that they're, they didn't want to publish their own games anymore. Uh, so they sold Battleline, all, or at least all the Battleline properties, to Avalon Hill. Uh, 3M did the same thing. They decided, hey, we're going to make tape instead of um, board games. Why, why were we making board games? Who knows? Um, uh, but that included Acquire, which is you know like an all-time Avalon Hill top seller. Um, and I think it looks like a pretty good game for the kind of game that it is. Um, any RPG is awesome if you got the right exact right people, though. That's that's that is you're you're right, but. Um, you could turn even a, an incredibly shitty RPG into a, a good experience for the participants. I mean, to what extent it is worth the trouble is the question to ask. Um, but uh, Mike Anthony says, buy second or third edition Dragon Quest and then get Ares with Arena of Death. Uh, I, I think I'd prefer the boxed version of Dragon Quest, personally. Yeah, acquire is a Sid Saxon design. Uh, it's a great. It's a it's a great design. I mean, I can tell you that I haven't played it. it it's a it's a great design. Um, I've watched uh, somebody. I wasn't watched it played. I think it was Heavy Cardboard did it. Why Heavy Cardboard did acquire? I don't know because it's not a heavy game, but but they did acquire and it it actually looks pretty neat. I'd like to play it and I have it, so we'll play it at some point. Boot Hill is another one of those games that I think it was it was designed in the in the we are not really sure what a role playing game quite is yet space. Now that was less uh, less clear in the later editions of Boot Hill, uh, but that first Boot Hill is a basically a gunfight simulator. Um, there is very few war game elements in it. Um, it's my belief that of all of the 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 RPGs that TSR did that aren't D, D, that the best one was gangbusters uh some people will say top secret and i think that's a i think that's a reasonable statement 
uh, because I think the original Top Secret was actually pretty cool. Uh, but I think Gangbusters is a great design. It's clean, it plays easy, it's thematic, it's it, and it's it's a hoot to play. I mean, you're playing gangsters. I mean, it's fun, right? Uh, Bleak Outlook 08. I do, in fact, I strongly prefer to um, acquire Avalon Hill games that are unpunched so that I can give them the deluxe treatment myself including cutting them out of the sprues because that's often necessary Doug Sunseth mentions Empire of the Pebble Throne uh, and that's a good call um, but I don't think it's as good an RPG as Gangbusters um, I think you're you're I mean you're you're there at Empire of the Pebble Throne for the setting right not for the game necessarily and it's not like TSR did support for it, right? Where they did actually do a little bit of support for Gangbusters. Uh, Bleak Outlook 08, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, David Harrison asked if I ever got to visit the Avalon Hill Game Store in Baltimore. God, I wish. I mean, that was... I was... Uh, so Avalon Hill went away in 1998. Um, so that was well after the point at which I was like an adult and doing my own hobby stuff. Um, so that was not, I mean, it was not an impossibility that that would happen, assuming that was still around in the nineties, which I'm not sure that it was. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> no, I wish that would have been neat. It would have been cool to see the dungeon hobby shop in Lake Geneva too. And I, you know, why did I not do that? I was, you know, going to Gen Con and not that much farther to Lake Geneva. So, Brant, thanks for stopping by. I, uh, Doug says that EPT was the first real deluxe RPG. That's true, but it's also like the second RPG. So, or third, depending on how mad you want Ken St. Andre to be at you. So, the... I mean, yes, you're right. But but it was also... Uh, it was a very, very early RPG. Um, and there's some mechanical stuff in there. It's a very much a mechanical variant of early D&D. Although I would argue that it is much cleaner mechanically than, than the early D&D that was around at the time. Um, I acquired... I wanted to do a video of this, but it turns out to be very unphotogenic. I acquired a Dungeon Hobby Shop catalog from our, our good friends at Noble Knight. And it's, you know, it's neat to look through, but it is literally just lists of text. So I was going to do a video of it, and then I decided it was going to make a shitty video, and I didn't I didn't do a video. So if you'd like to see that video, let me know. Uh, but we, we could totally do a leaf through. So this is, this, I wanted this one specifically, because this is the one I had as a kid. So... Uh, so the yeah, so Joe Perez is talking about SPI's acquisition by TSR, and acquisition by TSR is not exactly what it's more complicated than that. Uh, Joe says that SPI was heavily in debt. They either sold titles to Avalon Hill because they needed the money, or TSR sold those titles to Avalon Hill after they purchased SPI. Um, I don't believe that TSR sold any Avalon Hill or SPI titles to Avalon Hill. I believe those uh, were all sold by, for the reason Joe mentions, um, they were, you know, they needed the cash. They had they had severe cash flow problems. Um, Doug says D&D was 10, this is back in 75, I guess we were, we were, we're saying now. D&D was $10, EPT was $25 with a laminated full color map and full size rule book. Yeah, no kidding. It, it was it was super expensive, and uh, Avalon Hill did that too, right? With RuneQuest Third Edition, that RuneQuest Deluxe box was quite pricey. Um, so uh, it was. I just read Shannon Apple Klein's uh, history of uh, Avalon Hill. Uh, which only really covers Avalon Hill as a role-playing publisher in detail, but the but at the t I forget what what it corresponds to, but it was very expensive at the time. Uh, HBO Max has I'll, I guess we got a couple minutes. I'll talk about that. Uh, finished up Winning Time. It was fantastic. I you know don't even care if there's another season. Uh, it is was a fabulous season of television, and I'll watch that season that ten hours of TV again. Um, the maps in Empire of the Pebble Throne are amazing, especially when you consider that they're from 1975. Um, 
But HBO does have the Game of Thrones prequel spinoff, whatever the hell it is, coming August 22nd, apparently. They just released a trailer for it, which I watched but don't really care about. I'll, I'm will i sure if I'm still subscribed to HBO Max at the time, I will check it out. But um, Greg Kostikian has a, uh, whose name I may be mispronouncing, has a pretty good uh, article called Farewell to Hexes that uh, talks about the demise of SPI and the, um, uh, the the way all that went down. Now, it does leave out some significant details that I have since learned, like the way Victory Games was formed, for example. Uh, Doug Sunset says on guard, GM, GDW's On Guard was one of the first RPGs. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but I don't know what the chronology is. There was a there was a bit of a feud about uh, who the second RPG was, whether it was Tunnels and Trolls or Empire of the Petal Throne. Uh, there's no question that Empire of the Petal Throne was developed first because its development stretches well beyond well before 1974. Um, uh, but it may be that Tunnels and Trolls was sold first. That's possible. Um, Uh, Behazia Ingaris says Tanaris RPG is expensive. I'm not sure what product we're talking about here. Uh, latest Kickstarter was 289 for RPG stuff. I'm really doing my best to avoid Kickstarters at this time. I'm really doing my best to focus my RPG energies on the stuff right here and and right here, right? BRP and Traveler, and that's it. And I know I got the One Ring over there too, but if I was had made that decision when that Kickstarter happened, I probably wouldn't have wouldn't have ordered it but that said the product is really nice so uh ept uh, original ept was not that racy but when you started <coughs> to get into like the source book yeah there's some material in there that i wouldn't want to i'm not reading barker's nazi novel if you want to actually google it and look at the cover and decide if that is a thing you would really want to read <coughs> maybe you should reevaluate your priorities, okay? Uh, I, I, you know, don't discourage people from looking it up, but when you see the cover, you'll be like, yeah, I don't think I want to read that. I'm good. I'm, I'm okay. So, anyway. Yeah, I'm still spending plenty of money. I, I ordered stuff from Noble Knight, and I just ordered some more stuff from Noble Knight because they put stuff on sale. So I've got a um, Griffin Island and a RuneQuest Deluxe coming. Um both of which I had back in the day. My Griffin Island, so the reprint of Griffin Island actually talks about this. Um, when Avalon Hill did uh, RuneQuest, they, they had a different license for Glorantha than they did for RuneQuest. So they, 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 like they made the default setting sort of this like weird wasn't really that weird that was kind of the problem with it actually it was a bit bland like this fan fantastic earth type of analog and um uh andrew cook we could i could have a whole conversation about that and i don't know if we'll we'll be doing that this week um so some of those early like mythic earth source books from uh, avalon hill you know developed by chaosium for room quest 3 were actually really good the vikings thing was really good the, the ninja thing was really good um the um yes john thank you i will ping you after after the show the um the uh oh i forget where i where i was at with this discussion here but uh when i had uh they they they, they took griffin mountain which was this acclaimed campaign adventure um but and they, they retooled it to uh not be in glorantha it was in mythic earth and it was just an island you could throw the island anywhere right and they completely redesigned it. It's almost a completely different product. Um, and nevertheless, I, having now looked at the original Griffin Mountain, I'll agree it's a brilliant product. But I actually think Griffin Island was really good too, and I think it's a bit underrated. Mine was cut to pieces and long gone, so it would be nice to have a, a, a fresh copy of that. Um, so, uh, Raymond, Feist's, Raymond Feist's book Magician is based in part on his a D&D campaign that he was involved with at some point I think as a player and one of the plot points of that campaign was that it was a Greyhawk type of D&D world that was invaded by a Tecumel type of 
uh, Empire of the Petal Throne world, and Feist kind of built it up based on a lot of the same assumptions without really realizing that there was prior work in that area. And uh, Barker got incredibly, incredibly pissed about it. Um, and basically screamed so loudly that uh, about you have to help me sue Raymond Feist that Daw Books said, no, we're going to instead sever our relationship with you. Have a nice day after two books, uh, which is too bad. Um, if uh, Barker wouldn't have flown off the handle about it, that might have ended very differently and um, we might have had a better situation. And Barker's bout of complete fucking idiocy did happen after that time as well. Um, John Madison asked about GDW's RPG that Gary Gygax did and they got sued. Uh, that was Dangerous Journeys. Um, the game's actually called Mythos. The line is called Dangerous Journeys. It gets a little complicated. GDW actually did not end up taking a bath on that. TSR bought the rights. The settlement basically was TSR buying the rights from GDW and Gygax. So GDW got a pile of money uh, and they bought all the inventory too. GDW got a pile of money. Uh, Gygax got a pile of money um, and TSR did something with the inventory. Presumably they pulped it. Uh, the War Zone has copies of Dangerous Journeys and I still have all my original Dangerous Journey stuff. At some point I will do a video on Dangerous Journeys. Um, it's another one of those games that's got a lot of good ideas in it but it's not, you know... The whole you put the whole thing together and it really kind of is a not super playable let's let's put it that way um i really liked uh flame song actually i thought flame song had a really neat vancian barosian feel to it uh i thought it was better written book than the man of gold and i think if barker had continued to mature as a novelist i think we might have gotten something special uh but but he decided he wanted to have a fit and stomp his little feet instead um yes the later barker tecamo books that were published by zatola publishing which i have around here somewhere are not very good um they really could have used a, a, an editor's hand um anyway um it's not that difficult to find dangerous journeys it is very difficult to find a lot of that um uh, Tecamo material, I can tell you that. Of which I have a great deal, including some rarities, too. So, uh, we are done for the night. So let me tell you what is going on. Um, we have a Traveler Tuesday tomorrow, and I think I have a Traveler Tuesday video scheduled for next week as well. I have an unboxing video, which is going to be, if you didn't see it, um, which is going to be Race for Bastogne, which we'll probably be clipping next week, by the way. Uh, will be a fantastic in Aegis trays, by the way. Um, by the way, I actually find the... Uh, you got to be super fussy about the quarter, the half-inch counters in the Aegis trays because they, you can't fit them three wide. You can fit more, but you but you got to make sure that the that they don't keep the lid popped up a little bit. As, as you can see, it, it is doing a little bit here with the air units. It's a little bit of a pain. Uh, but the bigger counters work really well with that. Well, maybe we'll talk about that next week. And then there will be a preview this week uh, at some point of uh, Enemy Action uh, Kharkov. So look forward to that as well. And I'm, I'm trying to get on track with an RPG video every week. And I'll have news on the RPG stream, when and including when it is happening, um, which might be Sunday night. That is possible. Uh, monthly. Again, it's going to be monthly. So... Uh, we will do that. We'll talk about that next week. So everybody.